Welcome to The Invisible Thread. I'm Theo Dorgan, and my guest this week is the American cartoonist Art Spiegelman. Well, cartoonist is... Uh, <laughs> cartoonist really doesn't cover that art, does it? No, it usually implies somebody who has a squirt flower uh, on his lapel and a whoopee cushion ready to just slide under you. So uh, it's not from there, but... I like the tradition of uh, cartoons and comics, and it's really what I grew out of, and um, I don't have a better short-form description of what I do. Well, you could also say writer or graphic artist. Yeah, but then when you put them together, they become something else. Yeah. And uh, so I, I always like what Miles Davis uh, said, which was like, I'll play it first and tell you what it I'll is tell later. tell you what it is after. But then, yeah. then in that case, you're an artist. Okay. Did I you think you were... Well, you actually, you started very young, 16. You were already launched, weren't you? Yeah, I think I started doing this when, uh, in publications when I was 12, and then uh, got my first paycheck uh, when I was 15, so uh, at that point the die was cast. What's this? You were born in Stockholm? Yeah. When I did you leave Stockholm? Before I knew it. I mean, I was uh, <laughs> uh, at two or three. I was really a displaced, uh, a member of a displaced family from World War II living in Stockholm uh, in 48, and then by 1951 we moved to uh, New York. Uh, displaced from where? Where were the um, family roots? Well, my, my father and mother were f uh, Polish Jews. Amazingly, both survived uh, the death camps. Uh, they were married before the war, survived uh, together and separately. And then sometime in 46, I guess, they moved. Uh, they wanted to come to America, uh, couldn't do it right away, so they happily uh, took this um, ticket out of Warsgard. Silesia that they lived in in Western Poland and and uh, landed in Stockholm, where my father did well enough uh, as a salesman to reestablish uh, a life there that made him very reluctant to come to America, even though uh, my mother wanted to, and that's she won. Do you have any sense that that Sweden belongs to you in any way? More than Norway, you know, but but uh, less than Paris. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you, you don't have that sort of mystic sense of the place of my birth. Well, you know, it's just when I say I'm Swedish, I just get Snickers. I don't have the right uh, physiognomy for the job. I don't think I've ever heard, held a pair of skis in my hand. So it, it's just it, uh, the people I've met from there are, very, are swell, but I don't really feel like any real uh, connection the way I do with, uh, you know, Eastern Europe, Germany, France. Mm -hmm. that, that orbit somehow is uh, one that I do feel comfortable with. The game with. man. Spiegel, man. It's Spiegel, which means mirror. I like that even better because... Mirror is even better. Because what it is is my name then becomes Art Mirrors Man, which right. um, can't do much better than that if you're a polyglot. Or, or man mirror. mirrors art if you want to take the German construction <laughs> and reverse it back. Is that what you do? Do you mirror man? Is that well, at least, at least one of them in my narcissistic way, you know. Uh, I certainly am trying to figure out what it is that's in my head and get it uh, located on a piece of paper somewhere. Does it work straight to the hand? Does it go from the heart straight to the hand, or does it go through the mind first? Oh, gee, definitely through. I have so many s sensors and muggers up in my head uh, trying to whack anything I'm trying to get set out that it definitely uh, has no choice but to somehow weave its way through my mind and get onto a piece of paper. Yeah, because you, you, you came to Ireland this time as a participant in the Arts Council Critical Voices series. Are you a critical voice? Well, certainly, I've got to say that I am now. I mean, because uh, the country I live in has gone, <laughs> has run amok. And even though I never... I live in, not my country. No, it, it used to be. Yeah. I, right now, I, I just feel so edgy about... Uh, Displaced this, person, uh, even. Well, you know, I, I, I suppose there's always been an aspect of that for me, because that was my parents' situation, and yeah. um, I've inherited it. But for all of my uh, cynicism... There, there is a kind of embrace of America's uh, ideals, because you get it pumped in from such an early age, mm -hmm. and to see them been curdled so completely in the recent past has made me capable of saying things like I just said, which is, you yeah. know, the country I live in uh, has forced me to be a critical voice. You know, I never quite thought of myself as a political cartoonist. I was shied away from drawing caricatures, first of all, because it doesn't come easily to me, and second of all, because drawing politicians or presidents, nothing has a shorter shelf life. Maybe mm. yogurt. You know, it's just mm. it's just uh, anything you do then is out of date 24 hours later. And I was once asked when I was in a public interview with Jules Pfeiffer, who's uh, mm. uh, one, one generation up from me in, the, in being a critical voice, um, mm. I was asked if I considered myself a political cartoonist, and I said, yeah, but I work really slow. I'm still working on World War II. So recently I've had to accelerate and deal with things that have been happening yeah. uh, around me in New York.
work in the last few years. I want to come right back and sort of go back, go, go, come up through your life again, but just just for the moment, the the work you've been doing since the September bombings, September mm-hmm. 11 bombings, the, which have been running in the the London Review of Books. That that's where we'd have seen it on this side mm-hmm. of the Atlantic. Uh, there's a profound sense of passion, and at the same time, puzzlement mm-hmm. in those. Are you puzzled? Are you puzzled by how America responded, for instance? Well, not so much puzzled as saddened, because uh, the immediate aftermath, uh, the days after, all these flags cropped up. And I couldn't get my brain around them, because my generation specifically saw the flag as a a red flag uh, for a bull rather than Mm. for a political Mm. party, um, in that it had been its meanings had been appropriated during the Vietnam conflict in such a way that it, all it really meant was uh, uh, right-wing, super-patriotic... Well, uh, shorthand for Spire Agnew. That sort of thing, you know. So it was very hard to see that as the protective covering that was going to now come into place in the uh, aftermath of this disaster. I mean, it was your hometown, but then America appropriates your hometown. Well, that's the thing. Is, um, my favorite uh, bumper sticker in the months after was USA out of NYC. <laughs> uh, and then when I passed this no smoking ban in New York, I had my own, which was don't NYC out of NYC. Don't go there. Don't go even go there. But here's the curious thing. The American right does not, it seems to me, understand how Europeans responded to 9-11. I don't think they care. I, I don't think they care either. But, I mean, to me, it was an attack on a world city. But I'm very conscious. I remember back when Lindsay was mayor of New York. I remember the disdain, the hatred so much of middle America had for New York. It was mm-hmm. the Sodom and Gomorrah and the Hudson. Well, you know, if the Pentagon hadn't been bombed, the bombing in New York would have been about as remote as the one in Singapore. Hmm. It wouldn't have felt like America. The fact that it was this two-pronged thing, even though obviously the the focus has been on this much more dramatic Hmm. event in New York City, that's what I think located it for America's, oh, New York, it's part of our city, it's part of our country, you know. Mm. Um, and I got to say that it's become more American recently. I know you tried to shout me down when I talked about the smoking, but nevertheless, it's changed my city dramatically, and it's part of what came with the Disneyfication of Times Square. And, and it's all part of a, a new chain store in New York City that uh, mm. I, I find much more difficult but to But don't remember, you live Green Street, Canal Street, down below there and down in the into Alphabet City. I mean, it still seems to me a bit obdurate, is it? My neighborhood's changed a lot. Uh, it used to be, well, when I first moved in there, it was illegal living. You know, like you had to put uh, blankets up on the windows so nobody would see lights on at night. It was a manufacturing. It was office and manufacturing, yeah. Um, but it became really posh for a while. It became this, uh, the center, of the nerve center of um, the art scene. Mm-hmm. And now it's becoming the nerve center of the uh, Blanick shoe scene or something. It's like all... Uh, High fashion boutiques, uh, Bloomingdale's department store is opening on Broadway where Canal Jeans used to be, mm. um, and uh, there's furniture outlets for designer furniture. But the art uh, part of it has really kind of uh, siphoned off my. There are designer city. gardening shops for people who don't have gardens, but they're selling real tools. But they're designer <laughs> tools. I mean, it's gone very strange. Do you think of yourself as a New Yorker first, an American second? 